Okay, so this week, um, something that's come up recently uh, among amongst a few of my friends, actually, um, is the stress that we expose ourselves to as activists. Um, and it was, I've seen it, actually, it popped up on Facebook, uh, Shannon Cornelson, had a somewhat related blog entry about posting all these images that that um, you know images of cruelty on Facebook and 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 she had some I think some pretty good points about how a lot of us who are very compassionate and and who make make part of our lives to advocate against animal cruelty um, it really takes a toll to be exposed to this kind of stuff so we're gonna sort of share our thoughts on 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 how you can protect yourself a little bit from some of those effects. Yeah, and because um, the nor- there's a common pattern, which is that um, a person, well, you know, burnout, they go into the movement for, they're just new into it in, in uh, climate change or animal activism. They're exposed to a lot in a short time, and then they, they, they're really on fire, and then they burn out, and then you don't see them again. So what is it that makes the sustainable, what, what is it that makes activism emotionally sustainable? Like I've been doing it for 25 years, what, uh, uh, different causes, but I keep coming back to it and I have to ask myself, um, what do I do? And I'll, I'll just give you one quick answer. When I was doing a really serious activism before, a few years, about a decade ago, I made a rule for myself, I don't do this after nine o'clock at night. I just relax. And it doesn't matter what's going on. I have to have that time for myself. And that really helped me. Um, so that's one rule of thumb. Like, you know, di- good diet, exercise. Um, but also, I mean, what you're talking about, Michael, is the stress from it. And um, I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that it strips away something in you. Like, it is mm-hmm. hard. And you're exposed to something incredibly violent and awful, and your your illusions are ripped away, and there's no getting around that. It's just part of what what activism does, uh, and and then you just become a new person. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think the one of the best ways of dealing with um, the stress of learning the truth about how how much animals suffer is um, through the relationships that you build in a movement. And this has been true for any social movement in history. It's only as strong as the relationships within it are. So I think in, in the case of the group that I'm, I'm involved in, and, uh, and Michael and Paul is as well, are as well, is um, pig save and cow save. And um, one of the things we really emphasize is collective action and doing things together. And we notice a difference when there's just a couple of us at vigils. Mm-hmm. There, there have been times when it was just um, us two or... Um, us three. <laughs> well, so, well, or before Michael got involved. Mm-hmm. I remember there was once when it was just Paul and I. <laughs> it was quite a vigil. And then other times, like, Michael's driving me to the vigil, and we see St. Helens, and we see the smokestacks, and it's a killing facility where they kill you know, 550 cows a day. And there's this heavy, you know heavy feeling that that sets upon us and Mm -hmm. and then when we arrive and more people attend the vigil we get it just changes the whole dynamics we feel so much better and it just shows you the importance of building a a larger group and supporting each other and um and one one of the most beautiful things which is my last comment i want to make on this is that pia stein one of our members says that she actually goes to vigils to support other activists Mm -hmm. and i thought wow what a beautiful comment and i think Sometimes when you when you go to events, do it in support of the mm-hmm. other people at the at the at the particular activity. Absolutely. But this may, may seem sound strange, but I th- I find going to the slaughterhouse and doing bearing witness, as we call it, actually is uplifting to me. Uh, I grew up in the church, and um, to me, this is like going to church. Like it's like spiritually uplifting, because even though it's the most abysmal place on earth, it's a gulag, it's a death camp. The act of bearing witness uh, and recording what's happening and being part of the solution in whatever minimal way is 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 important, and it's you're part of some you're you're doing something rather than nothing. And ignoring it would make me feel worse. And I think that might tie into what you just said before, which was um, off camera, which is that when you how did you put it when you 
when you feel depressed from this, you don't do less, you do more? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So if I'm feeling stressed or upset, like I find that activism is actually an, 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 an antidote to uh, feelings of depression. Because, um, again, I think it's about relationships and supporting each other and also a sense of accomplishing something, like being exactly. there and, you know, you feel you're doing something for the animals, you're educating mm -hmm. the public, and you're getting support from, from fellow activists. And, and I, it's an incredible community, and I can't tell you how much the community yeah. I, I, has supported me Absolutely. at all levels, including personal level. Like, for example, mm -hmm. when my mother died, half the people at the funeral were from Toronto Pig Safe that I just met a year ago. Like, how much support is that? It doesn't yeah. get better than that for me. So that's right. just a small example of how incredible the community is. Yeah. Um, right. But there are some real issues here that we talked about. Like, on Facebook, there's often postings of really gratuitous violence against innocent animals. Mm -hmm. And it does hurt people. And I, I, there was a posting today by um, uh, Raposo. Um, mm -hmm. Was it um, Deborah Raposo? Oh, yeah, yeah. That she, you know, sometimes she doesn't even want to go to Facebook because there's all these horrid yes, postings. Yeah. And I think it's a real issue. And how, how do we address this? Um, you, you, the, well, it, you know, there's a, it's a rule of thumb that the, the earthlings and the gratuitous and the graphic stuff is only necessary for people to be aware of it. Not, not You don't have to, like, uh, most vegans I know, you know, they avoid earthlings because they already know. Uh, it's the people who need to see it are obviously the people who don't know. Uh, and that's why the movie exists. But it is true that it is, that it can also, the, the, it's so graphic it can desensitize you as well. And that's a double-edged sword with that particular video uh, or those kinds of pictures. Um, so another strategy or tactic that I noticed that you use is you post in, uh, pictures of, of happy animals and showing animals showing love for each other mm -hmm. and that affirms what it's for what we're striving for that kind of better world uh not just the gory ones yeah i, I post both of them i post okay. i post slaughterhouse images but usually i post it with a message and um i think deborah raposo said she, per, she she's okay with graphic postings if if there's a purpose behind it but if there's a, a, a gruesome picture with no context Mm -hmm. with no information about what country this occurred in or, you know, just right. really gratuitous violence. She finds that incredibly disempowering, and I can understand that. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, and then um, with respect to films like Earthlings, like I haven't seen it myself, but I have mm -hmm. seen other graphic films, and that's what actually converted me. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is my tolerance level for images has gone up since we've started bearing witness mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. so that's right. deep in it that um, now I can, I, I look at those slaughterhouse images and want to see them because I want to see what is happening to the animals that right. we're bearing witness. Yeah, yeah, I think if I can jump in on this, I, I agree with you. Um, first, I'm going to mention something that, uh, that, that Shannon mentioned in her blog, The Vegan Anomaly, about the topic is that, and I think it's a good point, is that if you're considering posting something like that, you should stop and think for a moment, really, what is the value of this? And if there's no actual value, like you were saying, um, then, you know, you should really think twice because as, as we've been saying it, it can hurt people. Um, that being said, I mean, if, if, if there's actually a potential that someone may recognize an individual because maybe it's somehow localized, that's different, right? I, I mean, I think we can see the value in that. Um, what I struggle with though, um, and I'm, I'm thinking one time I was, I was listening to Joanne MacArthur talk and she was saying that when she's doing photography in, in a cruelty situation, you know, she's running on adrenaline um, and, you know, it, it doesn't really strike her and she just goes in and gets the job done. And on the drive home, all of a sudden, just everything hits her and it's like all of a sudden the trauma. And just, then she starts thinking about what she saw. And I, I find that happens too. I find that when we're, when we're, you know, in the, during the vigil, vigil, what have you, we're doing outreach, we're doing, I'm trying to catch, f you know, film. Uh, it's the same thing. It's that I'm caught up in the moment. And then when I go home and sit down, um, one of two things can happen. Either if, if we had a particularly good day and we reached out to some workers uh, and it was positive, then I find it uplifting. Um, if it was uh, more of an average day where maybe we didn't uh, accomplish anything on, especially, you know, notable on that particular day, then I, I, I can feel depressed by what I saw. And it creates an interesting, an interesting like sort of quandary I find because, uh, and it gets back to the images as well, is that on the one hand, 
um, especially myself being working in video with, with a lot of these images, I think to myself, okay, I need to learn to just be able to look at them and almost like, like, like turning off the switch, like they talk about in Peaceful Kingdom, yeah. for the greater good of being able to get the information out. But then I worry if I, if I train myself to do that, I, do I run the risk of becoming less empathetic? That's what I worry about. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys experienced that, but it's a, it's like a, a concern I have. You have to be, you have, when you're in the middle of that situation, you have to be practical or pragmatic about your actions. So it is necessary, but I don't think you'll run the risk of, uh, of being less, less compassionate, um, by doing, by, you know, by being uh, pragmatic in the moment. Right. I mean, I think being, by being there, you've already demonstrated that you are. I think you run yeah. the risk of being more compassionate. <laughs> yeah, right. And that actually hurts more, actually. Than, because I yeah. think what happens with us bearing witness is we become more involved, we empathize yeah. more deeply, and we become more obsessed. Mm -hmm. And we start mm -hmm. devoting more and more of our time. Yeah. In fact, yeah. we want to devote our lives to it. Like, that's what starts happening. Right. You, you, I do think you have to, and this doesn't sound like very proactivism, but you do have to step back from some situations. Like, I remember walking through the vivisection labs or in the corridors where they do vivisection at University of Toronto here. And there was one moment where I, I looked into a room and they were carving up some animal and and just like I was overcome with uh, a sense of uh, horror and uh, and I had to walk out of the building and just compose myself and uh, sort of like regain my emotion emotional composure because mm -hmm. it was too much for me at that moment to under to a trot to because I felt so closely what the animals may have been going through or are going through still and in the middle of activism, you can't allow yourself to feel that. You know, you're, you, you can't because you, you just come apart. I mean, the first time I went to Cow Save, I cried. But now that doesn't happen anymore because I'm there and I, I, I'm really attentive to what's going on because I want to record it for the blog, right? And you have to be like, you know, like you said. Uh, I want to go back to something else as well, which is another issue we started with, which is how do you go on? How do you make it emotionally sustainable over the years? And one of the most depressing thoughts is you're not having any effect. And I want to just address that. And this is how I understand it. Sure, we may not shut down that slaughterhouse or that vivisection lab tomorrow. Not likely. But you have to look at it like this is a, a huge, this is a long term project and mm -hmm. you're one person among millions of people doing this. You may not seem like it, but there are millions of animal activists in the world doing this. And it's a cumulative effort. Uh, so you don't know when your good efforts might pay off at some future date. You don't know. Exactly. Uh, but it might have awakened, like if you hand out a leaflet on the street or do whatever, you don't know if you're planting the seed for some significant change in the future. And you just have to have faith that, you're, that it's going to happen. And that's the only way to continue. Because if you just say, oh, I'm not being effective because, you know, I don't see the changes right away. Um, that's just not a good attitude. You have to have faith. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's true. Like, I think um, it, in the history of social change, it's been like millions of people that have made social change happen. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a famous quote by Howard Zinn, the historian who wrote a People's History of the United States. He said... Every every action you take, every leaflet you give out, every picket line you 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 mm -hmm. you join, uh, every, you know every soldier you talk to about peace. Every 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 action takes place, and because every action that takes place makes a difference. Because when you add them all up, that's how social change happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and I think it's all true. And I, I think we see the growth of the animal rights movement where so many people are leafleting and giving out literature. It's really inspiring. Yeah. But, but even if I would say this too, even if I knew that I, my actions wouldn't result, you know, if the final end is not animal liberation in this world and it doesn't look that way sometimes, and it actually looks like, you know, cause of climate change, life on, on earth is ending. Even in that situation, I still would do it because yeah. I, f I find that, it's meaningful for me to have done that, to have taken a stand for what's right. Exactly. So I'm not looking at the end, the end result. I'm looking at what is doing my duty as a good person right now. So it's got a little bit like um, being the conscientious objector in war. You're not going to stop the war, 
right? The war is too big. But, but you yourself can withdraw from the war and take a moral stand against the violence. It's a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's a certain, there's a certain guilt you take on by being a bystander, even if, even if it looks as though your actions may really not have a, much of an effect in the end, because the bottom line is, uh, at the end of the day, I want to be able to be a person who said, well, at least I didn't contribute. You know, if the alternative was to just, just stand back and let it happen, I'd feel much worse about that than, than to have tried to make a difference, even if it didn't in the end. Yeah. Um, but much more positively, and something that I actually think of frequently and helps me is that if you look at every form of violence has declined over the last several thousand years in different stages, whether it's spousal abuse, whether it's violence against children, whether it's debtor's prison, any, any, I mean, it, even, I mean, f- torture, every single form of violence that humans have done has been declining uh, to the point where most of it hasn't been eliminated, but ostensibly, at least legally in most parts of the world, they're gone. Um, and, and so unless animal rights is going to be the single exception in history, then it, it's, it's just a matter of time and our efforts do matter, you know? There's, um, yeah, I mean, because women at one time were, cons- in, and in some cultures still, are basically considered property, right? Mm-hmm. Or certainly don't have the vote or whatever. And the interesting part is that there was a movement exactly. uh, to change that by women themselves. And that movement led to, to, to those changes. And they... Those and the same thing with the anti-slavery um, movement. Those changes occurred over, sometimes over many centuries. That's right. Uh, and it took a long time. And so you had the people that were involved with those movements had to have faith that what they were doing was right, and that someday, even if they might not see it, live to see it, that that uh, changes would occur. Uh, and even still today, of course, women are still subjugated and oppressed. So it's it's not like it's over. There's a continual exactly. um, movement that has to happen. It, it never, this is, to be an activist is a lifetime commitment. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm going to be an activist till the day I die. And um, I can't go back, right? And if I did, I would be violating who I am, right? And that would be very stressful. Yeah, that would be worse. <laughs> that would be worse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, there are stresses like being an activist. There are many stresses. For example, there's the issue of, um, you know, volunteer work, unpaid work, uh, you know, people mm-hmm. having to work. And then the, what they really want to do is do activism. But activism generally is not paid work. So there definitely is stress, financial stresses with, mm-hmm. with activism. Mm-hmm. And I, I know so many people in the movement who have nine to five jobs and they say, if, if only I could work full time on activism. And mm-hmm. it just like yeah. they're, and I really, I like hearing that. <laughs> There's more than one way to do it though. I mean, you don't have to just go to the slaughterhouse or whatever. You, there's a lot of ways you can contribute. And that's another thing people forget. Uh, so Michael has a camera, he's contributing by filming things. And uh, I write things, and uh, everybody can do something. Like exactly. if you do a little bit of activism every day, mm. for the if you do something for the animals every day, mm. even just for like a half an hour, an hour, that's better than not doing it at all. And uh, I think that's really important, actually, and that renews you as well yeah. spiritually. Mm. Like it, mm. it, it uh, makes your life meaningful, and it makes, and it helps the animals. Yeah, and there's uh, so many ways you can do it. Like you could turns uh, celebrations into fundraisers for animals like your birthday or in the case of my mom's funeral it was like all vegan you know the ve- there was vegan food vegan musicians it was just like i can't tell you how wonderful that was you know just having a vegan funeral um so you can just turn the other types of events and make them sort of animal justice events mm-hmm. and it just mm-hmm. adds meaning to your birthday party because Absolutely. you're fundraising for a sanctuary yeah. You know, um, yeah. So you, be, you know, can be creative. That's there, right. Like there's endless opportunities to advocate for animals if you just look for them. Endless. Uh, and a lot of them are fun. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't have to be really uh, stressful. Even going to the slaughterhouse, people think, "Oh God, I can't do that." You know, I can't see the the cows going into the slow. Of course, it's difficult. But um, like I said, I part of me finds it uplifting because I go and I'm part of that that ethical community of good people um, 
seeing them lifts me up. Being able to write about it and record what happened that day is important. So even though, and if, if I didn't go, it would, can, it would happen and nobody would know, right? So it's important that I did go. And even something as hugely depressing as that, it, um, you can bring um, creativity to it. I agree, because I think it's more depressing for there to be like five slaughterhouses in Toronto and people just looking away and not doing something. Yeah. So I actually find it really inspiring when I see people coming out to, 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 to vigils and bearing witness because that's what the animals want. So, you know, and that's what we would want if we were in the transport trucks heading to a killing facility. I mean, it's exactly yeah. what we'd want. So I actually find it, as you said, mm -hmm. very uplifting and particularly as the numbers go up. So we really, exactly. we really yep. notice it at vigils. Like, oh my God, there were seven people here today. Oh, I just felt the collective energy. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, it, it was just so great. And um, anyway, so I think it's, I think that's something to bear in mind is that um, there's power in collective action. And, and the community I find in Toronto is incredibly supportive. It's yes. a wonderful mm -hmm. community it's and the, it's, it's growing. It's the best uh, activism community I've ever been involved in. And I've been involved in, you know, peace activism, environmental, human rights, anti-mining. This is the best one. It is the most uh, purely altruistic and the most mutually supporting. Of course, there are people in the movement that, you know, will rub you the wrong way or you rub them the wrong way. There's always that. And every movement has those frictions. But I find on the whole, it's less in this movement than other movements. Um, on the whole, this one is the people in it are truly good. And this is not because I don't think they're inherently good, but I think there's something about the values that we share that lift us all up and make us, inspire us to be better. Um, and uh, I find, I've certainly found that because, you know, each human being can, they, uh, each person has within them uh, a good side and a bad side. And it's, it's a question of which side you nurture. And then by being part of that ethical community, you're nurturing the good side in yourself. So you become a better person through activism. Yeah. Um, something I'd like to add, when you were talking about how just even if you can only do a little bit um, every day, um, do not underestimate the power of a keyboard warrior. I know people say, oh, armchair activists. Yeah, that's not real activism. But but when you think about what Uncle Tom's Cabin did, you know, for, for the slave rights revolution, um, granted, that wasn't that wasn't what what took down slavery, but it was, but that ability to communicate ideas was such a big part in, in, in that movement. And, and now, as long as you have a cell phone or a computer, you can, you can share your ideas. And that is so valuable. You know, retweeting somebody just Facebook, to give them a, yeah. yeah, it's just incredible. Facebook is a really, really great tool for activism. It can't mm -hmm. be underestimated. I, and I would totally share what you're saying. Ideas are very powerful. Ideas are what transform society. Actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, ideas are what can enslave animals, and their ideas are also what can liberate animals. Absolutely. Um, and there's another form, one more point, which is that there's another form of stress that people go through, and we mentioned this in the last video, which is that people are really stressed out when people in their lives that they love or are close to don't understand or agree with them. And that can be really demoralizing, uh, like a husband or... or mm -hmm. um, or a child or something that is like, doesn't care and, you know, say is a meat eater and will never change or that sort of attitude. Right. And I don't know what, what advice to give on that, except in my own family, I just don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't push those buttons and I don't stress it. I just, I just let it alone. But it, interestingly, what's happened is just not even preaching or saying anything to my mother and brother and sister and so on over the years, all of them have become vegetarian or vegan mm -hmm. just by just through the uh, exposure to me. And I wasn't even pushing it. Yeah. So, it, but it took years. <laughs> my sister-in-law is starting to make that move a little bit. Her, my my mother-in-law is, so, I mean, we're, I'm seeing, is, I'm seeing it happen a little bit in my family as well. Um, and, and yeah, I, I mean, they're very, they're very much aware of my views, but I, I, I do my best not to bring it up at the dinner table. <laughs> so, I became an animal activist early '90s, and it was a big issue because I'm, I was always very close to my mom, and she only became vegan last uh, ten years. So for ten years, I was struggling with her, but then mm. the last ten years, she was vegetarian and then vegan. And my sister's vegan, so 
it's so nice to see these changes in families mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all the other activists I talk to, they, they have similar stories. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's encouraging because you know this movement is definitely spreading. Well, the one that surprised me the most is my sister wrote, um, I have two sisters and one is already fully committed to animals. Um, but then the other one I didn't, wasn't. And then I never, almost never hear from her. And then she uh, emailed me and said, you know, I'm almost 100% vegan because, and I said, I'm shocked completely because the last <laughs> time I didn't, we talked, you were eating animals. Like, how did that happen? You know, that's amazing. <laughs> So, and Excellent. another another uplifting thing that happens sometimes, you probably get this a lot, is uh, you get an email or a comment from somebody, wow, you know, you really changed my life. Mm-hmm. And you totally don't even know this person, right? Mm-hmm. And they just said this to you. Mm-hmm. Just, do you get that? P- postings on Facebook, yeah. yeah. Like people mm-hmm. I don't know very well, and they said, oh, that's gonna, that's making me vegan. Yeah. You know, yeah. That kind of yeah. thing. They might have been veg or it just some sort of transition, which is yeah. really positive. And, and you never know who you're reaching. That's, that's the right. point. So you have to mm-hmm. keep doing it regardless <laughs> yeah um there's a book there's a good book called aftershock by patrice jones i haven't read it yet so i'm not going to say anything because i can't but uh, that's something that people can think about and i know we've talked about maybe even investigating some meditation um i've never investigated it but i think it's probably something we should so that's maybe something you can think about too that's what, a great to, idea to de-stress mm-hmm. or something yeah yeah just, just to deal with maybe even in fact even we've talked about maybe de- uh, learning how to meditate before we go to a vigil just so that we remain calm and don't get worked up by some of the things we see. At our last Earth Festival this past Saturday, we had um, the Toronto Vegetarian Association's uh, meditation program, so they, they they did yoga for us. Mm-hmm. And we're thinking of doing that every month as we do festivals in the park. Right. So for us, but also for slaughterhouse workers. I, I think it's really important, I think yoga and meditation. One, one last point. Uh, another thing that will stress you out is arguing with somebody over this stuff. Mm-hmm. Don't argue. Waste of time. Just focus on the people who need it. I mean, that's common sense. But even I, I get pulled into arguments all the time. Yeah. Even though I'm it's... saying that, I still get pulled in. <laughs> and then I have to remind myself, this is a complete waste of time. And I have to back away. But, um, you know, especially online. If you get involved in some online argument that goes on forever, forget it. Yeah. Um, it, it's just more people, egos and stuff. It, it, it has nothing to do with the issues, really, at a certain point. Um, so I think uh, that's another way to de-stress is not to argue, just, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, a lot of us have been drawn into, you know, sort of Facebook arguments and stuff. Um, and I think the lesson I learned, at least, is like, it's probably best not to have these long threads and just mm-hmm. see if you can delete them. And some people will claim that censorship or, or not. Right. But at the same time, it, if it's not a productive discussion, mm-hmm. it's better to have it privately if people have concerns and they're always you know they're always real issues and differences of opinion and that's fine Mm -hmm. but it's better not to have it in in something that becomes highly argumentative on facebook and long threads and people getting hurt and things like that so that's the lesson i learned like i'm not interested in sort of getting into those kinds of debates with people in the movement where where you could simply bypass this whole public confrontation and talk to people and say you know what are your issues can we deal with you know i think that that that's the method yeah. that I, yeah, like I'm a private a private email the sh- to short circuit the uh, the debate maybe in some cases or I yeah. mean if it's a real debate that is like civil where there's a civ- there's a real issue being discussed that's one thing but when it becomes personal or it goes on forever then that's that's the kind that's unproductive yeah I think even uh, I just posted Lisa Kramer's lecture from last week um, and mm-hmm. the first post that went up was very vulgar. And it was, uh, I'll leave the vulgar out, but essentially the, the, the message was, uh, the vulgarity out, but the message was basically, um, you leftists are crazy if you think the world's going to go veg, um, <laughs> plus a bunch of F words. And, and so I just said, you know, I, I don't believe in, in, in um, or I said, I'm fully for expression of opinion, so I'm not going to delete your comment, sir, but I kindly request that in the future uh, that they not be of a malicious nature. And so then I've given the person the opportunity to continue to bring forth his concerns if he wants to. Um, but I've made it clear that, look, this, you know, mudslinging is, is not respectable and I'm not going to tolerate it. No, you know? w- one thing is to mention when we're talking about veganism and, and animal rights, you have to expect there are going to be people like that. Mm-hmm. You have to expect that. Um, and um, I mean, I've had debates with vivisectors here and they've called me names and all sorts of things. It happens. And you have to develop a thick skin because yeah. you're advocating for the animals. And they're slaves, right? You're in a slave-owning society. 
you know, so you you have to expect uh, animosity from people whose whose uh, self interest is threatened by um, by this moral stand that you're taking, mm-hmm. and that's par for the course. So I think it's similar to what we get on the road when people say, "I love bacon," or "Get a life," or "Get a job." Uh, or you're wasting your time. Um, and, you know, initially when I got those reactions, it, it really bothered me and I would sort of argue back. Mm-hmm. And now um, uh, my, I, I suggest to activists, just kill them with kindness. I give them a smile and say, you know, have a great day or something. Just mm-hmm. or, right. You know, or just sub, just be kind. And, and I do the same thing on YouTube. Like for the videos we post, we sometimes get really hostile comments. But I, I just give, I use a Gandhi and or Tolstoyan approach. Mm-hmm. And... You feel good at the end of the day, and exactly. you're more likely to plant some seeds mm-hmm. on the other side. Take the moral the... high ground. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Was there anything else you guys wanted? I don't think so. We've, we've yeah. gone on a little longer than we expected to. Yeah. So We have to start a lecture soon. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you for bringing up the topic. Michael. My pleasure. I hope it helps.